Paul has 28 years of experience with the Michigan Department of Transportation and was appointed as director on January 1st, 2019. He previously served for three months as Metro Region Engineer and before that as University Region Engineer. During his seven years in the University Region, uh, Paul oversaw his team's involvement in the planning, design, and construction of several major projects, including the US 23 Flex Route, right up the road here, a project nominated for the America's Transportation Award, landing among the top 12 national finalists. Other notable projects include the I-94 Rehabilitation Project in Ann Arbor, Jackson, the I-96 US 23 Interchange, and the I-75 Freeway Project. Ejiba holds a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Prairie View A&M University and a Master's Degree in Construction Engineering from the University of Michigan. He's a licensed professional engineer in Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Paul Ejiba. Thank you, Debbie. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm truly honored to be here today. Uh, this is a very special place for me because this is my alma mater and um, was fortunate enough to be part of the MCD project development team. Um, it was myself and about four others that kind of sat around uh, in a paper napkin and before you know it, MCD became a reality. So every time I come here, it reminds me of that, the, that time we sit in, in uh, Peter Sweatman's office over there, just kind of playing around. We decided we're going to walk the field, and before you know it, M City is now one of the uh, world-renowned test sites in, in, in the world. So I'm, I'm really, uh, truly honored to be here. What I, uh, my, my uh, topic today is connecting infrastructure and technologies for sustainable uh, safety and mobility. What I'd like to share with you all today is what we at MDOT is doing to be part of this technology renaissance. Uh, there's a lot going on out in the field of autonomous vehicles and connectivity, sustainability, all that. And we felt as a, as a transportation agency, we're not just uh, uh, transit and freeways and bridges, we're also a mobility. Organization. So what you're going to see today is a mixture of a lot of the things that we are doing internally to be part of that renaissance. Um, my topic today is we're going to talk about the, society, uh, the safety benefits of uh, technology. It's going to talk about the industry impacts. How does this impact the users? It's going to talk about the societal benefits and uh, economic benefits and a whole lot more. So after that, then we can open it up for Q&A. As I mentioned, when we talk about safety benefits, we have about 34,247 fatal motor vehicle crashes in the United States in 2017. And uh, take a look at the, the right side of that uh, uh, slide. 3162 fatal involved distracted drivers. That is a, that's a lot of accidents. And what are we at MDAC doing to try and be part of solving a little bit of this? As you all know, we have a campaign out there. It's a federal uh, campaign about towards zero debt. We feel that one accident is one too many. Then, I mean, if you take a look at that, 34,000 uh, federal motor crashes in, in, in our freeways yearly, that, that is way uh, so how can we help to reduce that number? Uh, Fort Traffic Operations Center is what we have. We have one in downtown Detroit, which is our largest uh, operation center. We have one in Grand Rapids. We have one in Lansing, and we have one in the Blue Water Bridge uh, in uh, Port Huron. Uh, th these centers are monitored almost literally around the clock uh, to see you know, what, what the traffic pattern is doing out there, how we could help adjust things uh, as you go to make sure that our freeways are safe for our users. We also have, um, we coordinate with law enforcement and, and, and traffic uh, officials uh, when they, 
let's say for instance downtown Detroit when there's an event, we, we try to make sure that we uh, coordinate with the city, the, the law enforcement officers, uh, change the signal timing so we can get people in and out of downtown on, on a timely basis. U of M brings in on a football day, we bring in about 100 and who knows, just to fill the stadium, not to talk about mm -hmm. people tailgating and all that. How are we as MDOT helping to help facilitate that? They gotta come in through I-94, through M14, to, through US-23, and all the surrounding uh, Washington Avenue, that's all part of our system. How are we helping all the local agencies, the, the, uh, the uh, law enforcement, to make sure that uh, safety is, uh, is paramount in, in when these events happen? Here are some of the things, as I mentioned, and the, uh, what we're doing in the uh, ITS realm. On the right-hand side, there are some bullet points that show the intersection conflict warnings, where we, we've identified some intersections that perhaps you have a, side, a vertical side distance problem or horizontal, whatever the case may be. We started installing some of these intersection conflict warnings to give the, the drivers a uh, you know, an advanced warning that you're coming into an intersection. We start installing um, um, ITS in uh, way motion so that to help uh, speed up enforcement, make sure that the weight, weight enforcement, all the, the, the truckers have to do is just drive over that, that weight, uh, weight motion uh, sensor. It'll show the, the, uh, the, the motor carrier what the weight of that. Uh, truck is, and if, if it's within the limit, it can move on. If not, then you, know, you, you, you deal with that accordingly. Um, I can go on with uh, transit uh, technologies. We're working a lot with our, uh, a lot of our transit agencies. For some of you who don't know, uh, the, the transit funding comes through MDA. MDA is more like a pass-through agency that distributes uh, transit uh, funding. So we, we work with them quite a bit to make sure that uh, the, the funding have been spent right. A lot of they they're using the right technology to uh, you know, box collection. A lot of these kind of coordination has been something we've been uh, really involved in. And we've seen a lot of good uh, results doing being part of that. Uh, traditional, the old uh, DMS. That's the the message uh, signs you see out there. Gives you warning about events, uh, accident on the freeways, whatever the case may. CCTV, these are things that have been around a while, traffic detection and uh, communication system. Um, on the systems engineering side, we have the active traffic management, which I think I will, I will get into a little bit. Uh, I'll show you an example of one that I'm really very proud of. Uh, we have the uh, connected vehicles. We have a, a, a equal partner in MCD and ACM. And that is the very first uh, public agency that, that really dip our toes into this uh, arena. We came to U of M and worked on partnering to uh, be part of MCD because we feel this technology also helps us at M you know, how, how do you design a road for these uh, autonomous vehicles coming down the road? How do these vehicles talk to signs, uh, pavement marking, on and on? And you're going to see some of the examples uh, of of what we are doing to be part of this uh, revolution. Um, safety for all drivers, uh, again, fatal crashes involving large trucks and losses in, in the United States, 4,500, that, that is a mad accident. Uh, more than 15,000 fire department vehicles involved in crashes nationwide, 15,000. Uh, that's, that's a lot of things attributed of that obviously, uh, and then one walk zone crash occur every 5.4 minutes. I will tell you this spring, uh, we have what you call National uh, Walk Zone uh, Week, and I was fortunate enough to go to Traverse City and do the uh, opening remarks or part of the, uh, the speaking uh, group. And the lady, Mrs. Snell, I'll never forget her, came up to uh, the podium and, and spoke about how she lost her husband in our construction zone. The construction zone was well designed, everything's clear as can be. They couldn't find faults in all the advanced signing, everything, the, the barrels, 
lay down perfectly. Middle of the night, they were walking out there, a drunk driver took him out. I mean, those are the things that, that stick with you as a, as a traffic and safety engineer, operations engineer, that you did everything you could to make sure that stuff like that doesn't happen. And when it does, it, it, it kind of wears on you. So for us at that we take this very serious, especially crashes in our work zone. Because again, that is somebody's that not going back home that day. Uh, 7.7 million commercial motor vehicle uh, drivers as of 20, 2017. And quite frankly, that number is increasing as we you know, trade goods and commerce from one end of the state to the other, uh, between uh, Detroit, I mean, uh, Michigan and Canada. They, they, that, that's 7.7 .7 million, million. Uh, it, it's a lot. 25% of annual line of, uh, line of duty uh, firefighters uh, uh, are due to crashes. 27% of life trucks have fatal war zone crashes. What are we as engineers doing to try and change these numbers, bring the numbers down as much as we can? Here's part of what we're doing. Uh, Again, the, the first uh, picture on your left is uh, what we started doing probably about 10 or so years ago. We started putting uh, available truck parking out there for truckers that are tired. So you know, um, you know there's, a, there's a rest area coming up. So you can kind of gauge whether you, do, you pull over and get some rest spend a night there, and uh, we, we've been doing a whole lot of other things to make it more comfortable for, for these truckers, put a lot of communication device there so they can call ahead and say, I'm running late, whatever the case may be. Uh, so we're not putting a button on them to try and get to the next mile, you know, drive the next mile and the next mile and the next mile when they fatigue. So we've been uh, seeing some good results with people taking the time to get off and, uh, and use this rest area. Uh, the, the, the next picture is, is one of a fire truck that, as I mentioned, that, that's a lot of uh, fire trucks that are involved in accidents. And how do we help prevent that? Uh, again, uh, on the construction zone, I will, I will share with you, if you look at the, the, the right uh, bottom picture, it's about uh, connected work zones. We are working with 3M uh, piloting a, a program where the, 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 the signs can talk to, to vehicles, the signs, even uh, the, the safety vest that uh, the construction workers wear out there, it, you know, you put chips in there where you, the, the vehicles can recognize that. I, 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 ho I wish the technology was available, perhaps maybe we would save the life of that, of, of that man. So we are working with a lot of industry partners to make sure that we are at the forefront of some of these technologies and, and, and be part of, uh, of, of the solution. Here, what are we doing in the elderly mobility? That's, that's another part of, of this whole thing. 22.5% of U.S. adults have this disability. 15.44% of Michigan population is considered elderly. One in five veterans in Michigan self-report one or more disabilities. And then 10 drivers in Michigan have declined by 14%, which means we are having an aging population. What are we doing to help make sure that the quality of life doesn't suffer because you, you, you're an older uh, person, right? So we are working with a lot of uh, a lot of cities and you know uh, transit agencies like ATA to try and come up with different technologies, keep up with with, with the rate of change in, in uh, technology to help uh, the, the disabled, the elderly to get around and, and be part of the society because nobody wants to feel like they, they, they're no longer useful to, to the society. 
This here is a mobility challenge initiative that the governor, to have credit, launched at the other show. It was an $8 million grant. Uh, the, the money was to be, uh, you have to compete for, for the grant. Uh, the, the idea is to try and address, again, as I mentioned, some of the uh, elderly population issues, the disabled, uh, uh, the, the youth driving, and also uh, the, the government term, the mobility challenge. Uh, we had uh, very good success. AATA was part of that, uh, that program, and they, they, uh, they did benefit quite a bit from that. So they, these are things that we at MDOT and as a state government think we can do to help move the needle a little bit. And uh, you know, the governor doing the, this mobility challenge did help spark some interest and competition. Uh, and, uh, we hope to continue that. We've seen some success stories about that. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Michigan Mobility Challenge is to address uh, uh, elderly uh, disabled. Here, this slide kind of shows how the mobility ecosystem for us at MDA, it's, it's kind of very broad. There are a lot of other companies that we partner with that are not on this list. But just to kind of give you a snapshot, look at all the auto, epicenter of auto, look at all the auto industries that are all part of it. Uh, and then in the education side, you have U of M, Kettering, um, MSU, Lawrence Tech, Michigan Tech. So we, we believe bringing everybody together, start sharing ideas and, and, and talking things out, we can all be part of uh, of, of, of this renaissance. So, uh, again, if your company is not on this list, please forgive me. There's just not enough room to put everybody in there. But, uh, th this next slide kind of shows, you know, again, 59.8 billion worth of goods ex exported from Michigan companies in 2017. That, that's a lot. And we, as MDOT, we play a big role in that. I just came from uh, Devon uh, with the governor. We have a, a bridge, Miller Road Bridge in Wayne County that leads into Fort Plant. This bridge is uh, about 88 years old. It was built in 1931. Right now that bridge has got about 405 temporary supports holding it together. Because it's so old, it's gonna cost about 58 to $65 million to, to replace the bridge. But since Wayne County doesn't have the money to, to fix it, and this bridge is the pipeline to a truck plant right next door. So we can't afford to shut this bridge now. What do we do, right? So part of the governor's budget is to try and address a lot of this uh, aging infrastructure. And while we, we're replacing them or fixing them, try injecting some new modern technology in this infrastructure so that for for future Ford plant or any other industry that uses our system can manage their, their, uh, their they, they can uh, plan their, their, their coordination better. So it's been a very, it's been a challenge, but I think we're making progress. Uh, Michigan's number one export of transportation equipment in, in 2017. Sixth in nation for exporting goods 10.5% of transportation equipment manufacturing exports come from Michigan companies. So we are a big player in this whole global uh, market. How do we stay competitive? And that's part of why we're all here. Innovation is something that we take very, very seriously. We, we, I've, I've told our folks this, that Regardless of how much money the legislatures give us to try and address an aging infrastructure, we have to continue to be an innovative organization. We have to innovate. If you don't innovate, you're going to be standing still. The, the world's going to pass you by. So we, we, we're doing a lot to, to keep up with um, not just the latest technology, the, using the right materials, doing peer-to-peer -peer exchange with some of our other agencies in other states. And uh, again, take a look at that 90, 96 out of 100 uh, top automobile suppliers would uh, have a presence in Michigan. $12 billion funded into automotive 
research and development annually. 500 plus miles quick roadway for civic testing. That, that's the other thing I kind of want to highlight. We've made Michigan such an attractive place for companies to want to test their product. Our legislature, I give them a lot of credit. Over the years, they've passed a lot of legislation to allow for that environment. You have companies coming into Michigan. You, uh, at any given time, you can see autonomous vehicles driving down the street of Inaco or down the street in Lansing. We, we're equipping our freeways with a lot of this technology so that companies that want to really test uh, uh, you know, a real life uh, uh, product and pilot, we, 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 we allow them to do that. I'm working with Jim Sayer right now. We're looking at how we can use the US 23 flex route as a testing site. And these are things that other states are not, that have not caught up to yet. So Michigan, in my opinion, is way ahead, uh, ahead of the curve when it comes to creating a, 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 an environment conducive for testing. And uh, we hope to continue that. As I mentioned, the, the 3M uh, test that we're doing, uh, uh, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of testing now with 3M, Tidec, uh, Continental, and uh, Magna, we're doing uh, plutonium. Uh, they believe Continental did a uh, plutonium uh, uh, test between Michigan, Canada, and come back into Canada. With the Peloton also came into to, uh, Michigan. That's a company out of Texas. So Michigan creating that environment to attract companies to want to come in and test their product in a life situation, I think it's been it's been very it's been great for us as a state. Part of this whole thing is also creating a Michigan Council on Future Mobility. I'm a part of this, I'm the co-chair of, of this uh, uh, council. And what we do is we get together uh, monthly, talk about emerging technology, what can we as a state do to keep furthering that R and D furthering uh, the, keeping a, 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 a mission, a, a, a place where people want to come and, and not just test their product, take out all, uh, any barrier that could be in the way, if it's legislation, if it's uh, uh, whatever the case may be, to, to try and keep, keep that momentum going. As I mentioned, uh, Polo, uh, Peloton did a, a platooning dock uh, Planet M. Um, there's a right there on Jefferson Avenue. There's a roadside unit that was placed there during the uh, last ITS conference. So we, we're collecting a lot of data with, with that. And part of it, what we hope to do with that data is to see, okay, how is how is this technology moving forward, helping safety? And I think again that being the first pilot. We we, we hope to expand that. Uh, I mentioned the Tadek Platon uh, by National uh, Autonomous Drive, uh, and then uh, the, the 3M product that I mentioned uh, we're using in our construction zone as well. Uh, American Center for Mobility, as I mentioned about MCD, this is another uh, testing, outdoor testing lab that M that invested in. It's uh, one of the biggest in, in the country. It's quite frankly, I always call it every city on steroids. It's, you know, you can, and I just test your product. They're also looking at making it a center for, uh, you know, getting your certification and, and things like that. And we're very involved in that. And it, it's, it, I, I think it's a good thing. And city, as I mentioned, this is a 32 acre connected and autonomous uh, vehicle uh, outdoor testing site, first of its kind. Part of what I mentioned earlier is that we have to continue to innovate. MCD started, and since then they've been really raising the bar. Every every opportunity they get here, inject new things in there. So you want to keep attracting industries to come in and test their product. Because this technology really is moving at a, at a rapid rate. Uh, as I mentioned, we have about 500 uh, sites out there that we have a lot of uh, ITS technology equipment that we, we tested on. On I-275, we have the curb warning system to help safety-wise and slow down. It kind of gives you a warning that you, you, you 
come into uh, a, a, you know, a, a vertical or horizontal curve. Then uh, I-94, we have the uh, road weather information system. Is the road uh, slippery, slow down? And it's not just in the winter time. What about when it's raining? Or a, a very misty morning when you don't even expect it? So that's, that's what that's supposed to help do. And then uh, on 696, we have a backup uh, Q warning system. Uh, some of you guys do know if you're in the traffic and safety or operations arena, you know uh, most times that, that's when you have your secondary accidents, when you have backups and the, the car coming is not, maybe it's in a car, whatever the case may be, they may not notice there's a backup and then it's climb into the, the last vehicle and the, the abdominal effect. So what this is supposed to do is help one of those vehicles that's a, that's a, a backup that uh, slow down. And uh, again, try to enhance safety as much as we can. On I-96, we have a pavement condition uh, sensor of the same thing. We try and do all we can on the safety arena to, to warn uh, motorists about the, the condition of the roadway. Uh, this is a project that's really near and dear to my heart because it started off with just, just an idea. Uh, okay, we have a problem on US-23 between Brighton and Ann Arbor. Uh, the, the problem is that this is a two-lane, two-way two freeway. It's overly congested, over capacity. When people are coming into an hour in the morning between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., it's a total parking lot. People can't get in. Uh, I mean, a lot of time wasted on the freeway. And then subsequently in the evening when they're leaving an hour to get back home, you spend more time on the freeway because you can't get there uh, from here. So. This idea is something we were kicking around. The first thing was, should we widen the freeway? But widen the freeway costs a lot of money. You have to buy a lot of property and displace people. And the, the other part of the, what made that even more complicated is that you have a lot of endangered species in that corridor. So you have to go through the environmental process, quite frankly, some of them you may not be able to mitigate. And the Federal Highway Administration would not let you do anything about it. So we came up with the idea, okay, well, why don't we collapse the freeway in the middle, make it a wider shoulder, because what you really have is a six-hour problem. You don't have a 24-hour problem. If you drive through that, that corridor during the day around noon, the, the two-lane is enough capacity for the, for the traffic. It's just a six-hour problem during the day. So why don't we find a six-hour solution to a six-hour problem instead of creating a 24-hour solution to a six hour problem. So we did this flex route project. If you've never driven it, it's between Enabo and Brighton. It was a more than $20 million project from planning, design, and construction to system integration and implementation out there. Uh, to put a, another lane out there, widen the freeway with a cost of close to about $400 million. So getting that, this, this project to me is a gift that keeps giving because we're doing a lot of testing with U of M out there. We, we're getting a lot of very good information. So uh, this, I think, is probably the wave of the future when uh, you, you have a lot of constraints that will allow you to do things the, the conventional way. you got to look for ways to try and uh, uh, maximize what you have. So this is a thing we're really proud of. We're looking at expanding it all the way to the uh, 96 interchange in, in the future, hopefully with some of the, uh, the, the discussion going on about funding. If we able to get some funding, we will do that. And we've also identified uh, other locations that we think this will be uh, appropriate. Um, I-96 between uh, 275 and US-23, that Milford area there, Novi Milford, that's, that's almost similar to the, the traffic pattern you have on 23. In the morning when people are going into Detroit, it's, uh, eastbound 96 is just backed up. And then in the evening when they're coming home, uh, westbound, same thing. So we are looking at doing something similar to this. And also in Grand Rapids on the US 131, uh, we, we, we believe this, this would be a, a, a good candidate for that. So with that, I will open it up to any questions you may have, and uh, let's, let's have an have a open discussion. Yes, sir. That flex line you just showed. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. 
Is there one of them or one on each side? The, the shoulder is one on each side. So there are a total of two extra lanes. Uh, it's not, we don't call it a lane, an extra shoulder. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are people allowed to drive on six hours a day? Well, three hours uh, southbound mm -hmm. in the morning. Uh, the, 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 that side, the overhead sign you see there, there'll be a green arrow that's saying you can use it during that, that period. And we have a, we have a tra trans uh, traffic operation center in Lansing that they monitor it. Even sometimes when we have accidents out there, we can use it for, uh, to, uh, to control traffic. But what they do, like 6 a.m. when traffic starts picking up, coming into Ann Arbor, they turn it on. What you're going to see out there is that left shoulder uh, open for traffic with that sign, and then people can use it to get in. And then around 9, 9.30, when traffic is dying down, they shut it off. You see an X or where that green arrow is right now, it changes to an X. That's a fully paved, normal lane. Yeah. Yes, so, shoulder. Shoulder. <laughs> What's the penalty for just leaving open 24 hours? Because again, number one, you don't need you don't need it. You don't okay. need it during. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I came I came through there around uh, 11 o'clock today. I, it got through there easily. There's no backup. So it, it's what we call right sizing the project for the problem. You have a six-hour problem. You find a six-hour solution. You don't need a 24-hour solution for a six-hour problem. So uh, and that was part of the deal we made with FHW for them to let us do this. We said, okay, it's not gonna, we're not going to use it as a full lane 24-7. We just need to use it to get traffic in and out of and out a certain time of the day. And uh, it's, it's been working out great. Another question. Yes, sir. Uh, it's great to be in Michigan. Also, it's, it's also great to see many initiatives as well. Have a computer, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just wonder like, what would good, what would be a good way for us to make those Michigan solutions as national solutions? Mm -hmm. Because we cannot make cars only for Michigan. Mm -hmm. yeah? If the if these solutions are nationwide applied nationwide, mm -hmm. then it becomes a we can make next car we are accommodating these new technologies. I just wonder a good way to promote this Michigan well, initiative. Well, uh, that's a great question. I tell you, I give up. Uh, previous director of that credit. He was known nationally as somebody who really promoted the ITS technology. He was on a lot of boards and I'm getting on some of them now trying to tell the Michigan story. Uh, we have ITS America coming up in June. Those kind of uh, venues, in my opinion, is where you tell our story to the rest of our peers and uh, other people from around the world, quite frankly, come to Michigan, see what we're doing. I know that our states are, are reaching out to us to find out how are we able to convince our legislature to pass a lot of these laws allowing vehicles to be tested on our road with live with, with other traffic. But also we had a governor, uh, and this, uh, our new governor is the same way, with the same mindset. If we open up the, 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 the market, people will come. Uh, governor Snyder was very proactive about the, the, the whole idea of pushing legislation to to make this a, a conducive uh, state for people to want to want to build it, and uh, Governor Whitman is taking up from where he, he left off. Uh, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, good things happen. Sure. Are there any plans to extend the flex route a little farther up to 96? Yeah, yes, ma'am. I, I mentioned that earlier. Yes, that's the plan to go all the way to 96. Uh, we stopped it at M36 because uh, one, we, we didn't have the money, and two, uh, to, to re reconstruct that whole interchange. If you noted know on the uh, on the west side of that interchange is a McDonald's. Uh, all that property there, we have to try and find a way to de redesign that interchange where we don't displace a lot of property. That how do we? put in a new interchange, make it a little wider to carry that on without touching those properties. It's, it's, it was part of the challenge and we decided let's just stop it here for now and then we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up later. Yes, sir. The, um, the district you had 14% um, uh, fewer teen drivers. Mm -hmm. um, how much is that a, a demographic shift versus just teens not driving? I've had two kids myself that didn't get their licenses until 
Well, it, it's a big part of it, but I think what I was trying to show there is that we have an aging population. You're right, this new generation, they'd rather live inside the city where you, you can live, walk, and play. You don't have to drive. Um, I know a, a lot of teenagers or uh, college grads that doesn't want to, they, they don't need it, they don't want a car. They would rather live inside the city, they get out, take the bus, or go ride their bikes, or whatever the case may be, to walk and back home. And you've seen a lot of that. So then you got to talk about, uh, you know, Placemaking, how's that? All that mindset is going to have to go into. But what I was trying to demonstrate there is that with the elderly, elderly mobility, we still got to try and adjust to, to accommodate this guy. Yes, sir. So I'm working with a company called Petrie Mobility. Mm -hmm. So we're a startup company with kind of the thesis of uh, doing private public uh, partnerships mm -hmm. for funding smart infrastructure. Right and to reduce fatalities. We have a pilot uh, in Oakland County that we're just starting. I'd be interested in your views on um, how do you go about funding? Well, your views on connected vehicles, mm -hmm. connected infrastructure as it relates to getting to zero fatalities, mm -hmm. and then your thoughts on uh, best ways to fund it. Well, I, I think what we've been able to do very well is find willing partners. Yeah. Uh, Toyota, Ford, GM, Kia, you name it. So we've been able to, to work with them very well to try and uh, partner and advance this technology. But as far as financing, uh, with MCD, MDOT, what we did was work with the Federal Highway Administration uh, to get the grant to be part of that uh, whole project. Uh, doing a P3 on, uh, on mobility, I, I think that that's, that's a tough market. I don't know how. Yeah you get your money back out of it. So I, I would not, we've not tested a, a, a P3 on, on mobility yet, but I, I, it's not to say uh, it's not feasible. So if you have a better idea, perhaps you can share with the rest of it, what yeah. you guys are doing in your, your. Yeah, well we're just getting started. Okay. Right. And so we've got a number of ideas, but we want to test it, okay. pilot it, okay. uh, get a lot of consumer and stakeholder engagement Okay. to, uh, that is a really challenging uh, dilemma. Absolutely. So how do you, uh, what, what's your market uh, uh, target? How do you plan to get your money back out of it if you do a P3? Um, well, our, our technology has a capability of you know, maintaining an anonymity with uh, vehicles that are, that are connected, okay. but also collecting revenue. Okay. So then, then the challenge I know is what types of mobility services that can you offer mm -hmm. to uh, citizens that would be attractive, valuable, that they would say, yeah, I'll opt in for a, a subscription for mm -hmm. you know, a priority lane or the ability to get out of the stadium mm -hmm. faster mm -hmm. or um, for freight carriers to be able to get maybe signal priority. There's a lot of you know, different applications we're considering and any one probably isn't sufficient to fund right. the infrastructure, but if you develop a, a robust ecosystem where you could, in close cooperation with um, counties and cities and mm -hmm. MDOT and USDOT to right. put these forward, then our, our, our thesis is that there's a way. Um, an interesting concept, really. Yeah. Very, very unique. I, I don't believe I've come across anything out there yet, but I think uh, you may be onto something there. That's our hope. Yeah, so, no, seriously, yeah. it's an interesting concept. Yeah. Good. Yes, sir. Um, you mentioned how young people are wanting to move out of cities and actually don't want a car. Yes. They oh, yeah. prefer not to want a car. Not to want a car, absolutely. That's a walkability and transit and flightability and so on. Right, right. I think this is a really welcome and wonderful trend that we should encourage. Because people who live in cities, I guess we're in the whole book about this, have much smaller vehicle footprints, energy footprints, mm -hmm. and car footprints. Mm -hmm. Urban dwellers are better because mm -hmm. they don't drive so much. But the only country in the world where transportation is the biggest slice of our green, of our energy pie, greenhouse gas pie. Mm -hmm. Only in the U.S. is transportation the number one. Right. So what I'm worried about autonomous vehicles 
is uh, a lot of single occupancy, mm -hmm. ABs, and a lot of deadhead trips being taken when they're empty, mm -hmm. which could technically add to the vehicle miles travel, add to carbon dioxide in the air, and other greenhouse gases, and actually aggravate, which is a, what is the biggest problem facing humanity by far, which is climate change. It's much bigger than mobility for elderly or disabled. I mean, climate change is the big, the big challenge with some pretty big time bombs ticking. So I, I'm really worried about them increasing vehicle miles travel. Mm -hmm. Unless they're shared, yeah. and I don't know if they're going to be shared. And what about all those dead head trips where they're just cruising around? This is a big issue. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't disagree with you, but I'm, I'm of the opinion, quite frankly, that. Uh, you, the, the placemaking piece is going to be very, very important moving forward because you also see some of the el elderly people are moving into the city. Yeah, they're, in the city. yeah they, they're building old folks' homes closer to the cities where right. they have access to, uh, you know, uh, library, whatever. Because some even want to continue education just to mm -hmm. keep their mind uh, on. So. Us, the, that's why the, the, the governor's mobility challenge then was, I thought, was a great idea, so that we can encourage the, those kind of, uh, uh, you know, mobility for the elderly. Yeah, you're right. Autonomous vehicles coming. There might be some of the issues you, you brought well, up. I actually talked to the governor at graduation, and she agrees that climate change is, is the big kahuna. Oh yeah. yeah, no question about it. But I think again. Us in the middle age group are, are probably still the ones that are so attached to our vehicles. Yeah. The younger generations are moving away from that. They, they rather just you know get out and walk around, ride their bike, and they're happy. So uh, I think we, we changing our the middle age group mindset is, is really the challenge. So sure. I mean, just because, I mean, it might also be that just the younger generation is just delaying, right? doing the same thing as the other generations. Mm -hmm. I guess there is still a need to have like robust fashion. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So um, our bridges throughout the state are, you know, obviously aging pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, is there any um, innovation and some ideas about how we might use connected technology, connected infrastructure to either equip on vehicles that can help us load on bridges and to help us predict where over time so we know where to kind of put the money down the road. Mm -hmm. and or, well, that's, as I mentioned, uh, the innovation piece. That's that's the challenge for us now. We have an aging infrastructure. Uh, this is our opportunity to put in the next level of technology. As I mentioned, like Miller Road, when we rebuild that bridge, right now what I've asked Wayne County and Ford Motor Company to do is sit down. Talk about uh, uh, what Ford, <coughs> Ford is a big player in this arena. What do you think you're going to need in future for on-time delivery? For a whole lot of other things that you think this infrastructure will serve you well. Um, yeah, every location is going to be different based on the use. And I challenge nice to make sure that we just don't go back out there and put back what was there. I think we'll, we'll be doing ourselves a huge disservice. Let's try to be a little forward thinking and think 20, 25 years ahead, where is this technology going? How can we be a little bit ahead of the club? And, and that's, that's the new mindset now in that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. MDOT's mission of vision statement and website mm -hmm. has a list of performance measures for the entire system. Mm -hmm. So, from the perspective of your presentation, mm -hmm. are there any performance measures besides city mobility mm -hmm. that technology will help to address in your mission statement? Mm -hmm. So, things like the emissions, the climate change, mm -hmm. land use. Yeah, we have a dashboard for like our bridges. Part of this is to, we say we uh, the challenge we're going to have at least 95 percent of our bridges in good or good condition, and the dashboard kind of say what we are doing to to, to If it drops, you see and how do we 
get it back up. So we have a lot of performance measures that perhaps may not be on the website, but yes, that we are. We, we try to monitor. Again, the, the bridge one is the, the one that I, I say we really place, place, uh, pay close attention to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, sir. Paul, what are your thoughts on like, competing technology with the SRC and cellular? 5G? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was hoping I'd get out of here without anybody <laughs> asking me that. But, uh, no, I, I agree. I think at some point the industry is going to have to decide where, which one are we going to use. I know Ford and a couple of other industries have said, well, we're going with 5G. And that's why I said US 23 uh, flex route is, is the gift that keeps giving. What Jim and I are now working on right now is, okay, uh, how about we test both, both technology on 23? I told her uh, when I met with the Ford group, I said, you guys just declared 5G is what you're going to use. How about we put 5G on one side, maybe northbound, and we put DSRC on southbound, um, and let's, take that, uh, let's take, test that technology over time, and then we can all sit down and compare. I mean, it's not to say one is better than the other, but let's see what, what results we get. Uh, so we're working on that. Uh, Jim's really taking me up on that. I haven't heard back from, from the Ford, Ford folks. Again, my, my uh, pitch to them is I'm not trying to change your mind on what you decide you're going to do. Well, let's test it. Perhaps maybe the, 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 the data will speak for itself. So, yeah, that, that's, uh, to me, I think it would be good to, to try that and see. Yes, sir. When you're putting in new intersections now, I hear that, that that's being requested. That you're always putting up a connect uh, uh, looks like unit. Mm -hmm. How how true is that? I mean, at what do you see that happening more? Well, yeah, I, I think the uh, the city of Detroit. Uh, you're involved in, in, in that uh, yeah pilot program right now. We uh, the city of Detroit is really for thinking about uh, putting the uh, RSUs uh, in a lot of their intersections. Uh, not just to collect data, but also for, for safety reasons and everything else. And I think it's uh, it's it's well worth it. Uh, again, the only way you know if technology works is if you try it. If you put it out there and collect data and, and compare before and after. So I'm 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 all for it. I think it's a good thing. So, because with that, I think I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna wrap it up, Debbie. Thank mm -hmm. you.